gospel for a few days, a few sessions. What is the gospel? What isn't the gospel? What it is and what it isn't. And I, I keep going over this in my head and, uh, and, and just trying to clarify more and more this gospel message. But let's look at this. We've seen it a time or two already. I just want to go through this slide quickly. What is the gospel? What is this good news that we speak of? Do you, did you give him the gospel? He, he understands the gospel. Uh, I gave him the gospel years ago, etc. What is that good news according to the scripture when we're dealing with salvation? And this is, uh, I've got three different definitions here. The saving message or the news about Jesus Christ. The gospel is about a person. It's the saving message or the news about Jesus Christ that must be believed in order for a person to be saved from the penalty of Adam's sin. We've, uh, we've hashed this out for, for a couple of sessions now. The gospel is objective. It's based on fact. It's not based on emotion. It's historical. It really happened. Uh, as I've said before, uh, almost no one denies the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was a real historical figure. These things occurred. So the gospel, this good news, this message, is an objective historical message of what God has done to freely save us from His justified wrath. Adam did sin. Adam did disobey. God was justified in condemning Adam to death. But God freely saved us from His justified wrath. He was able to forgive us for our sins and provide us with eternal life. That's what the gospel is. It's also the last definition here. It's the true story of the lifting of Adam's penalty made possible and only made possible through the death, burial, and resurrection of the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Again, we've seen this slide a couple of nights. I just want to keep these thoughts flowing through your minds of exactly what the gospel is. The big question is, once we understand what the gospel is, once we're introduced to Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as Messiah, as our sin bearer and all those things, the resurrected Messiah, what is man's part in being saved? What do we do with that information that we have? Another slide tonight, the bad news is, the bad news is that all human beings are born sinners in Adam's family. We all know that we can trace our, our DNA back to Adam in the garden. He is everyone's father biologically. Noah came after him is everyone's father biologically. We can all trace our heritage back to these two men. But the bad news is that all human beings are born sinners in Adam's family and that means we're separated from God with no relationship with God and will die in the lake of fire eternally. That's everybody's truth. That's every human being's truth. Every little baby that you see, that's the bad news of his reality, her reality. All human beings are born sinners, separated from God with no relationship with God. And then the gospel comes along. Jesus Christ is introduced. The gospel then, which means the good news, is that Jesus Christ died on the cross in our place. He took each of our sin penalty upon Himself because we're all sons of Adam. We're all born with the same penalty that God levied against Adam. So Jesus took each of our sin penalty upon Himself. He was buried and rose to eternal life three days later. That's the good news of salvation. That is the gospel. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we've, we've looked at that. The death, burial, and resurrection. He was crucified. According to the scripture, he was buried. He rose again. According to the scripture, that's the gospel of, of first importance. What I gave, what I received, that's what I gave you, Paul says. The gospel first in Corinth. The work of Jesus Christ, or this work, this death, the crucifixion, the paying for the sins of the world, His burial and his, and his resurrection, this work of Jesus Christ enables us to be forgiven of our sins 
It allows us to be clothed with His righteousness and to have eternal life. That's the only way. Jesus said, I'm the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It's this work, this gospel news of the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's only that that can forgive our sins. It's only that that can allow us to be made righteous before God. Justified is the other word for that. Justification. And it's the only way we can gain eternal life rather than the eternal death we're born with. So the question remains, though, that I started with, what, what must a human being do in order to be saved? The idea is, well, what do human beings have to do to make Jesus' work effective for their salvation? How do I get saved? You can tell me the information about Jesus Christ, but how do I make that mine? How does His work transfer to me and save me? And what's the answer to that? Believe. Believe. The word is believe. The word is pistuo. Pistevo is how the Greeks would pronounce it. Pistevo, it, it's... Um, uh, in the noun form, it's the word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, and it means to believe. It means to believe in something. I added a piece to the definition tonight. It means to rely upon something. What does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ, that, that He is God the Son, that He is the Savior, that He is your sin bearer? Once you know the story, how does unbelief move into belief? How does an unbeliever destined for the lake of fire forever... How does he gain eternal life because of the story of Jesus? He has to believe it. He has to rely upon it to save him. He has to trust in it. He has to have faith in it. And the last one, believing something, is trusting a proposition to be true. So I can give someone or you can give someone all this information about Jesus Christ, who he is, what he did on behalf of of that person that you're witnessing to, that you're giving the gospel to, and what is it that they have to do? They have to trust that what you're proposing to them is true. They have to believe it. They have to rely on it. Not rely on themselves. They have to rely on this information, the gospel, the good news, that Jesus came to save Adam's helpless race. Believe, to trust a proposition to be true. Look at what it says in John 20, verse 30 and 31. John picked out seven miracles, and the Gospel of John, the book of John, is about these seven miracles. And he chose these seven miracles that Jesus did so that, this is his statement in John chapter 20, this is the thematic statement of the whole writing of the book of John. Why did you choose these seven miracles? Why have you shared these with the world? so that the world would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's why. His message was salvation. So he says in John 20, verse 30, Therefore many other signs, not just these seven, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. I only had so much space. God the Holy Spirit only breathed through me, bore me along in 21 chapters, and I'm done. But these, these seven that I've chosen, these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Again, the word pistevo, pistuo, however you want to pronounce it. I've proposed Jesus of Nazareth as the Savior of the world. I've proposed, John would say, that Jesus is not only the Messiah, but as the Messiah, He is the Son of God. He is God the Son in human form. And I've proposed to you that He was crucified for the sins of the world. I've proposed to you that as a dead man on a cross, they took Him off and they put Him in a rich man's tomb. And I've proposed to you through this book that on the third day He was resurrected to life, a life that I myself witnessed. 
That's what I'm proposing to you, the unbelieving world. John's gospel, the propositions of all these things are that so the world may believe that Jesus is who John proposes him to be, the Son of God, and that believing that, believing that he's the, the crucified, buried, and resurrected Son of God, you may have life in his name. Now think of all the taboos of all the churches and look what's missing there. The believe and join a church. The believe and tithe. The believe and keep the Ten Commandments. The believe and make Jesus Lord of your life. The believe and all the other and do this. They're missing here. John says salvation is through belief. That to have eternal life comes through believing in the story that John proposed through the seven miracles that he brought out, that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Believe. Now let me ask a question because we've been talking about the Ten Commandments too, and we've batted it back and forth a lot. So we need to go back into the Old Testament thoughts just for a minute. And here's the question. Has salvation for human beings always been about believing? Or... Or, here's the other choice, or was it once about obeying the Mosaic Law, which includes the Ten Commandments? Has salvation for every human being who's ever lived always been about believing the proposition of God? Or was it once salvation through obedience to the Mosaic Law? What's the answer? It's always been about believing. It's always been about faith. Look what Paul says to the Romans in Romans chapter 4, verse 2 through 5. Going way back into the Old Testament to the first Jew, Abraham, who lived hundreds of years before Moses and the Ten Commandments and all the other Jewish commandments. Look at what, look at what Paul says to the Romans about salvation. He says, if Abraham was justified or made righteous, declared righteous by God, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So he's already set up a contrast here. If Abraham was declared righteous by God because of something Abraham did, then Abraham can go to heaven and do what? Boast. Tell everybody about how great he is and what he did to get there. Paul says, not possible. That's not what the Scripture says. He says, what does the Scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God. He had faith in God. He believed a proposition of God, the truths about God that God had shared with him. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He was justified he was declared righteous by God at the moment he believed. At the moment he put his trust in what God told him was true. And then he goes on to define this a little better. He says, now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. If salvation is by works, then when you get to heaven, it's not, it's not grace that you've gotten to heaven by. It's, be, it's because God owes you something because you've worked. God has something that's due to you that He has to pay you back for. Now we're talking about salvation here, not rewards. We're talking about the Christian birth, which occurs at a split second in time, not the Christian life, which is the rest of a Christian's walk. We're talking about how does an unbeliever go from unbelief to belief. Believe is the word. Abraham believed God and God credited to Abraham righteousness. He didn't work. Now to the one who works, as I just said, if you're working, then his wage, what is due to him, is not a favor. It's not grace. It's not free. It's what's due to him. But to the one who does not work, but believes. You see the contrast in working and believing. 
Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5 are all about justification by faith. You become righteous, you're declared righteous at the moment you believe, not by any works of your own. He uses Abraham like he does in Galatians as the obvious example. To the one who does not work but believes in him. Pistuo. The one who does not work but believes only. Who does no work of his own but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness. This isn't about works. So again, the question is, what does a human being have to do? You go out and you witness to somebody in the grocery store. You give them the information about Jesus. They look at you with big eyes like, I know I've got a problem, and I know you've just presented a solution. Jesus Christ, what do I do? What do I do? What what is there for me to do? I know what you've told me Jesus did. I understand that. What do I do to make what he did effective for me? You hear the question? How do I make his work my work? How do I become uh, um, recognized as the one who is saved? And the, the question is answered in the Bible. Faith, belief, faith, pistuo, pistis. It's faith only. I want to talk about this too just for a moment. Because we banter this, back, uh, this word back and forth a lot, and I just don't think we spend enough time really understanding what grace means. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, what does it say? For by grace. See, it starts with grace. The whole salvation event starts with the word grace. Cotis. C-H-A-R-I-S. By grace. If not for God's grace, forget Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It doesn't continue. It starts with God's grace. Salvation by grace. And what does this word grace mean? There are a thousand different definitions. I boiled it down as much as I could dilute it. It's undeserved, it's unmerited, and it's unearned favor from God. It's not payment do because of something I've done for God. You see, if I'm working for something, then God owes me. But salvation isn't about what I do. It's not me earning something before the Father. It's not about Him showing Him that I'm worthy to be saved. Good night. We'd all be unsaved, still dead in our trespasses and sins if that were the case. But by God's grace, His undeserved, unmerited, unearned by us, unearned favor that we get from God is a good biblical definition of grace. That's what it is. And the Bible says it's because of God's grace. It's just start with the fact that we don't deserve it. I'm not trying to put us all in some sort of, oh, shucks, I'm just nothing. That's not what I mean. We're, we're made in the image and likeness of God. We've got the Imago Dei. We are His workmanship, His craftsman, His, uh, his, uh, his ultimate masterpiece, according to Ephesians 2.10. But He didn't save us because we were made in the image of God. He saved us by grace. That's what the Scripture says. It's by grace that we're saved. There's no merit that God finds in man to say, oh, I must save him. He's so lovely. And some people that just make the hair on the back of your neck stand up to hear that. It's biblical truth. That's what grace is. It's undeserved. It's unmerited. And it's unearned. There's no human that's ever walked that earned salvation. It's a free gift. Even Abraham... Because if he worked and deserved it and merited it and earned it, what does the Bible say? He'd have something to boast about. What does Ephesians 2 say? It's by grace. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. What? So nobody can boast, lest anyone should boast. Because heaven is not a place where we're all going to get together around a round table and talk about just everything that we did for God to make Him save us. Heaven is a place where we're going to all be praising Jesus Christ as the Lamb who was slain. Read Revelation chapter 5. That's what they're doing. 
So all glory, all honor, all merit, all deserving, all, 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 of, all of those words go to Jesus Christ. The gospel is about Jesus Christ and the Father's love for man in sending Jesus to the earth. How does a man make it his? By believing in it, by trusting in it, by believing the proposition, by trusting the proposition to be true. Look what it says in Romans chapter 11, verse 6. A definition of grace beside works. Remember this. Undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor. Grace. Now look what Paul says in the book of Romans in chapter 11, verse 6 about grace. The definition of grace and how it is 180 degrees opposed to works. You can't have both. They can't even be in the same room. It's one or the other. And Paul says, but if it is by grace, if it's unearned, if it's undeserved, if it's unmerited, then it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Otherwise, the very definition of the word grace breaks down. You can't have both. So why do we have people preaching the gospel, believe and? You can't have both. According to Romans chapter 11, verse 6, Paul's very clear that if we're saved by grace, like he told the Ephesians, and we are, it's something undeserved by man, then man can't add his works beside it, or grace is not grace. It's definitional. You can't add works to grace. Grace is undeserved. Any work that you do for God, He owes you. You can't do that. If it's by grace, it's not of works. A very, it's a great contrast verse. If it's by grace, it's not of works. Otherwise, grace isn't grace. Plain and simple. So look at what... what let's let's uh, focus here on these thoughts. What must I do to be saved? Again, you've told me what Jesus did. I'm an unbeliever. You've told me the story of Jesus, that He's the Son of God. Uh, impeccable. You've given me all the facts that I need. Crucified, buried, resurrected, had no sins of His own, paid for my sins. My sins were poured out on Him. Okay, I understand it all. Now what? What is my part in salvation? I understand what Jesus did, but again, what do I do? And the answer is, according to the Bible, you trust. You rely on and you believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected. It's as simple as that. I'm trying to simplify these things so when we get to the list of what salvation is not, You'll understand so well what salvation is. Well, obviously, the keeping of the Ten Commandments. Well, obviously, that's out. Obviously, you got to believe and do anything is out, or else grace is not grace. And Paul said we're saved by grace. So how do you become a believer? How did we become saved? How did we go from eternal death to eternal life? We trusted, we relied, we believed in the tale that we were told, the account of Jesus of Nazareth. We believed it, that He was crucified for us, that our sins were poured out on Him, that as a dead man He was buried, and that three days later He resurrected to eternal glory and lives forevermore. That is the gospel according to Paul in 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How do you make that effective for you? How did we? We believed it. This is the only way to be freed from Adam's sin penalty. The only way to be freed from Adam's sin penalty. Did it come back up? You agree with that, right? There's only one way that a human being, every, every single human being who's ever lived, 
Adam forward, every human being who will ever live from this day until we enter into the eternal state. That includes everybody in the tribulation born, everybody in the millennium, thousand year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Every man that's born. This is either a true statement or Jesus Christ is a liar. This is the only way to be freed from Adam's sin penalty. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I am the life, and no man comes unto the Father except through me. So to be in heaven with God eternally, Jesus said He's the only way. And what does the Bible say over and over and over that, that a man has to do to be saved? Believe, 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 have faith, trust, rely on. Now, a couple of these thoughts from last time. Getting the gospel wrong. I gave you some of these and I, I had a lot of eyes looking at me with some of these. I don't think any of you disagree with them. And we will unpack these as the days go on. I'll show you verses that are very clear about these things. Believe and do good works. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. If that's the gospel, then grace is no longer grace. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 are wrong, and it's not by grace that we've been saved, and so throw out the whole Bible. If, that's, if that is a true gospel that you have to believe and do good works, then the Bible is fraudulent. It, I could pick it apart. In three minutes, I could make you want to burn it because I could show you a hundred verses that show that this is not the gospel, believe and do good works. It's believe and be saved. Remember what the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what did they say? Believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. Believe and keep the Ten Commandments. It's not the gospel. That's not what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 36. It's not what He said in John 3, 16. He that believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't say anything about the Old Testament. Didn't say anything about keeping anything that He told Moses. Didn't say anything about good works. He that believes the Son shall see life, but he that does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Did you hear that? That's Jesus' words. He that believes in the Son, always talking about himself in the third person. He that believes in me, is what he was saying, shall see eternal life. But he that does not believe shall not see life, but God's wrath, the wrath that God has toward Adam's fallen mankind, God's wrath continues to be on that man. There's only one way to lift the wrath of God. And what is it? Jesus. The crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believe and be saved. These other things are not the gospel. Believe and be baptized. Welcome to the uh, uh, Church of Christ. Church of Christ meets here. You see the Church of Christ. This is what they preach. This is what they believe in order to be saved. In order for a man to go from death to eternal life, he has to be baptized. Now, I mean, they believe that like it's a part of the salvation message. Not get saved and then at some very near point in the future get baptized. That's not what I mean. I mean, get, get, believe in Jesus and be baptized, then you're saved. We believe in baptism, but we don't believe that baptism has anything to do with salvation. It's a public proclamation of, uh, of salvation and what God the Holy Spirit has done. But it's not a part of the salvation message. The Bible says believe and be saved. Invite Christ into your heart or ask Jesus into your heart. Jesus didn't say that. When Jesus said he that believes in the Son, has, he, he has life. He didn't, he didn't use these words. He didn't say uh, he who invites me into their heart will have life. That's not the gospel. Inviting Jesus into your heart is not biblical truth. You don't find those words out of any prophet's mouth, not prophet, out of any apostle's mouth, out of any writer of Scripture. You never hear those words. It's not about inviting Christ anywhere. It's about believing what He did for you. 
make Christ Lord of your life or submit to the Lordship of Christ. That's not the gospel. For by grace you save through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Doesn't say anything about this. For there is salvation in no other, for there is no other name given among men, given on earth among men, whereby we must be, whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus' name. It's His character. It's His work. It's His person. That's how we're saved. The salvation, a couple of points under this, just to, just to make you understand what I mean by that. The gospel is not a promise or a commitment that you make. The gospel is a gift of God to you. It's not a gift of yourself to God. Oh God, save me. I, I'll commit my life to you. That's not the gospel. The gospel is undeserved. There's nothing you have to do to make any promises to God for Him to save you. That's not what the Scripture says. The Bible says, believe and be saved. They asked Paul directly, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe. He didn't add anything to that. So if you want to add something to it, throw away the Bible and write your own, because that's not what this book says. The gospel is not a promise or a commitment that you make. The gospel is not something that we do for God. The gospel is entirely a love gift that God did for us. When we were undeserving, when we were lost... A verse, Romans 5, 8. Let me read it to you so I don't botch it. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You hear that? God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, undeserving, unmerited, unearning, While we were still sinners separated from God, Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for us. The gospel is not something we do for God. I'm just trying to clear up some of these these thoughts that maybe you bring in from a different church that you were, you know, I've got a past. I was a Catholic for 20 years. So we uh, we have to clean out the cobwebs, that's all. We need to have to clean out the cobwebs. That's what we're doing. The gospel is not coming forward in a church and praying some prayer, some sinner's prayer. The thief on the cross. Remember what the thief on the cross said? What did he say to Jesus? But the other answering rebuked him and said, Do you not even fear God seeing that you are under the same condemnation? Are we in, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. We're crucified for a reason. Rome has a reason to put us on the cross. We are in, we indeed justly being condemned, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, who did he think Jesus was? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Who did he think Jesus was? The Messiah. God. Adonai. He called him Adonai, which is the Greek word for, for, uh, for God. It's what most of the Jews use for God. They call him Adonai. They'll never call him Yahweh. They call him Adonai. So this man on the cross called Jesus not only God, but he called him the king. Because he said, when you come into your kingdom, your kingdom. So what does that make Jesus? The king of Israel. This man on the cross recognized him as the as the promised Messiah. And what did Jesus say to a man hanging on a cross, sure to die either that day or the next? They broke his legs. He would have been dead by sunset. What does he say? 
Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, either Jesus made an exception for this man, which is unusual because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but through me. He that believes in the Son has life. He that does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Unless Jesus made an exception to his own teaching, and we know that's not true, this man believed that Jesus was the Christ, believed and was saved, and Jesus said none of this to him. It was a very simple, salvific statement from this man, I know your God and I know your Messiah. And Jesus said, you got that right. You're one of me and you'll be with me today in paradise. Whatever you've done on earth will be washed as white as the driven snow. Today you'll be in perfection. He didn't say... It's unfortunate that you, that you think that because you're right that you have to believe in me, but you don't have the opportunity to enter heaven because you can't come down off the cross and do the good works that are necessary. You can't come down off the cross and keep the Ten Commandments. You can't come down off the cross and be baptized. You see my point? You can't come down off the cross and live a life of submission as, with me as your Lord. You can't come forward in a church and pray a, a prayer. See, Jesus didn't make any qualifications for the man. And some people will say, because people say everything they want to to dispute these facts, there are churches built around the concept that they would say, oh, well, that was Jesus Christ and He could do what He could do. He was God. He made an exception. Very interesting, because in John 14, 6, He said... I make no exceptions. None. No one comes unto the Father except through me, and the way to get to the Father is by believing in me, and those are the words of Jesus Christ. No exceptions. So all of these things we will go through in the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks. At what moment are you saved? The moment you believe the saving message. When is an unbeliever saved? The very moment, split second, nanosecond, that you believe the saving message, the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He did all the work in saving you through His death, burial, and resurrection. Every one of us has believed that. That's the moment we are saved. That's the very split second God the Father declares us righteous. He clothes us in Christ's righteousness. He justifies us. He gives us a spiritual gift. He forgives our sins. He adopts us as adult sons in the family. And that list goes on and on and on. God the Holy Spirit places us in union with Jesus Christ. We're in union with Jesus' death, burial, and His resurrection according to Romans chapter 6. And it all happens in, in, less, in less time than you can blink your eye. Now that's a gift from God. You didn't lift a finger to deserve that, and I promise you, I didn't lift a finger to deserve it either. That is grace. By grace, we're saved. Salvation cannot be both Jesus' work and our works, or else grace breaks down by definition. It's no longer grace. Grace means we didn't deserve it or, own, or earn it, and if our work had anything to do with getting us saved from eternal hell, the lake of fire, I'll say, then it would not be by grace. The Bible clearly says that we're saved by grace. Look what it says, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Again, for by grace. By grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. I could pick this verse apart, and I really, really want to for some reason, but I'm not going to. It's by grace. And if you don't start with God's grace, you don't go any further in that statement. Salvation is by grace. 
And that knocks out works altogether or else grace by definition, re, 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 it stops being grace. Titus 3, 5 and 7, look what it says. Titus 3, 5 to 7, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. I mean, what else do you need to hear? Not works. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done, but according to His mercy. Now, what is mercy? It's God withholding something that we do deserve, right? Where grace is God giving us something that we don't deserve. Mercy is God looking down on the sinner, Adam's child, knowing in the, gar in the garden, he said, on the day you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will surely die. What you deserve is death, human, son of Adam. But in my mercy, I'm giving you salvation instead. I'm withholding the judgment and the penalty that I could levy against mankind by mercy, I'm saving you by faith through grace. By grace through faith. According to His mercy. What a loving God. What a giving God. According to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit, all those things happen at the moment we believe, whom God poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace... Not by works. I love when mercy and grace are in the same phrase. It wasn't by works that God saved us. It was according to His mercy, by His grace. So that being justified by His grace, we would, made, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's another one of those things that became yours immediately. Heirs of salvation, heirs of eternal life, potential heirs with Jesus Christ of reward and eternity. One more statement, and we're done. God the Father's work through the cross of Jesus Christ brings people into a harmonious relationship with God and one another. God the Father's work through the cross of Jesus Christ, that grace undeserved by mankind work, God the Father's work through the cross of Jesus Christ brings people into a harmonious, not a fighting relationship with God. Not a relationship as enemies, but a relationship to Father-Son adopted into His family. We're in harmony with God now and with one another in the body of Christ. We have peace. There is no peace without God's grace. If grace doesn't come first, we would never have found peace with God. There is no way for a man to come unto the Father except through Jesus Christ, which was a grace gift, undeserved, unmerited, unearned. There is no peace without God's grace. That statement alone right there that you and I live at peace, eternal peace with God the Father, should be enough for us to set aside everything else we do in life and worship Him with everything we have, heart, mind, soul, spirit, body, all of it. That He gave us peace with Him through a simple decision that we made one day to believe, to trust in the propositions that were presented to us because faith comes through hearing and hearing by the Word of God. One day the Word of God, the Word of Jesus Christ in the Scripture was presented to us and we accepted it. We believed it. We trusted in it. There is no peace without God's grace. The last verse here, Romans 5, 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, not by works, we now have an ongoing, a present tense possession of ours. In the past, we were justified by faith. It's got ongoing uh, ongoing um, effects in our lives. We were justified by faith and now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, a peace that will never leave us. We'll never be the enemies of the cross, even if we want to make ourselves enemies of the cross. Can't be done. 
can't be separated from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Paul says it this way, for I'm persuaded. Listen to Paul's list of what it is that can separate you from salvation and separate you from the love of God. This is Paul's list. I'm persuaded that neither, that none of these, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, and you and I are created things, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. What can separate us from our so great salvation? Nothing. What can turn us from life back to death? Nothing. So why does the Methodist church believe that you and I can lose our salvation? Because they do. That's not what the Bible teaches. You wonder why all these denominations are out there. There are reasons. There are theological reasons. Every one of them has a theological reason why we don't hang that sign on our door why our door says Gulf Coast Bible Church. Theological reasons split the churches into denominations. It's not just what, what they like, it's what they believe heartily in their hearts and their souls. But we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And to that I say, Amen and thank you, Lord. Let's close and go to our prayer meeting.